So last night, she actually covered five keys. What are the five keys? The first key is how to retain beauty, which is proper form. The second key is how to retain wealth and nobility. The third key, how to protect one's family from destruction. The fourth key, how to be reborn in the presence of the Buddha. The fifth key is how to retain freedom of travel. Tonight, Venerable Jury will be covering the last five keys, which is how to live blamelessly. The seventh, how to ensure trustworthiness. The eighth, how to eliminate obstructions to practicing the Dharma. The ninth, how to avoid Mara. And finally, how to be greeted by Buddhas upon death, and how to hear the Dharma, and how to be free from suffering. This is just a very brief summary, so that you have a better idea of what the talk will be up later. The talk will be starting in five minutes. Thank you. Only welcome Venerable Dr. Jerry. We are very honored to invite Venerable Dr. Jerry Wei all the way from Australia to give us a talk on 10 Keys to Happiness. Tonight is the second part of her talk. Let us welcome her. A very good evening to everybody on the four one Buddhists here today. There are some seats up front, so you may want to move forward so that later comers will not need to you know, move all the way through you. So please come forward, yeah? We just fill the seats in front. First, yes. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Welcome, everybody. It's very nice to see some faces back from yesterday. I hope you all had a very good night's rest last night. Everybody checked in? <laughs> checked into bed? <laughs> Okay, so the 10 keys to happiness. Do you want to take a seat? I'm going to stand on ceremony. It's one and a half hours. Yes, please come forward. There's another seat here. There's a stool in front. Come forward. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here on a Saturday evening. It's not easy at all. Okay, now as we settle in, Please have a seat. Are there enough seats? Yeah. As we settle in, this is the tradition of things that we do. I'd like to introduce the concept of checking in. Now, how many of us were here yesterday? Oh, about half. That's great. So you would know about checking in. Checking in is the opportunity for us to ground ourselves in the moment. Checking in. I'm checking in to a hotel. Reminds our body and mind that it's time for us to be in this space. So would you like to join me for one minute of check-in? Okay, great. So, let's sit up straight. Now check. Comfortably. Enter a very safe space. So let's close our eyes. And now, let's bring our attention to the top of our head. We will be scanning our body and relaxing all our tensions, letting go of all anxieties in our body. Starting from our forehead and our eyes, facial muscles, relax. Our neck, shoulders. 
shoulders, upper arms, forearms, hands, fingers, relax. Our back muscles. Relax our back. Our thigh muscles. Calf muscles. The feet. Our toes. Feel our body relaxing in our seat. The weak tensions leaving the body. If there is still any place in our body calling for our attention, send it loving kindness to let it go. Just as our body relaxes, let's bring our attention to the tip of our nose. Gently watch our in-breath and out-breath without judging and without controlling for one minute. This one minute of being, of being with our breath, allows our mind to calm down, to appreciate the conditions that have brought us to where we are today. And it will allow us also to see the true nature of our very being with a deep sense of gratitude for all the conditions that have brought us to where we are now in this space. Let's gently open our eyes and come back to the moment. How do you feel? Calmer? More peaceful? Yes, well, I hope that you can constantly do it. That will be the best time for us to take this one minute break. All it takes is just one minute to relax the muscles of our body and then watch our breath for one minute. Or every now and then, when we're standing in line, but just at the moment, we are supposed to make a very critical decision for the day. Again, this one minute. Or as we wake up from our dreamland, just as the alarm clock goes off, before you get out of bed, one minute. And just as you're going to fall into our dreamland, <coughs> Go to bed at night, again, this one minute. I hope that if you take away nothing from these two days with me, at least you'll take in this check-in. Checking in. It's good for body and mind. 
It's a great habit to build up. Okay, check it in. Today, 10 keys to happiness. I'm going to run through what I've done yesterday at um, jet speed. So, happiness. Happiness is not pleasure. Pleasure is, for example, doing things that we like and taking pleasure in the chocolate, in the coke, taking pleasure in my travel. The difference is that such pleasures come and go. That means once the stimulus, once those conditions are gone, the pleasurable feeling is also gone. Happiness is quite different. Understand in July, there will be uh, Chris Gardner coming to Singapore to talk about the, the National Achievers Congress 2015, the pursuit of happiness. We have seen that movie, right? The pursuit of happiness is modeled after Chris Gardner. Now Chris, in his pursuit of happiness, turned over his entire life and career. How did this happen? He was divorced. He was, he was divorced, but he had to take care of his son. He was homeless for a period of time, but yet he was able to make his career work. He made a lot of sacrifices. He worked very hard, but he got his dream job, dream job. And now he's a multi-millionaire. He's traveling around the world, giving talks to show people how one can pursue success in life and happiness in life through his success. And of course, we want everyone to grasp the opportunity for success. But as Buddhists, Success is not defined by the dollars in our bank account alone. Happiness is not defined by just having the number, by being titled a multi-millionaire and being able to go around the world to give talks. Now, that really is very good, but there's still not Buddhahood yet. There's still not Bodhisattvahood yet. We aim higher. We aim to work very hard, very diligently, that all these circumstances are not going to stop us. Look at Venerable Master Xin Yuan. What did he have to go through? He had to go through war. He just doesn't have only one child to look after. He's got 1,500 of us to look after. So many children. He's looked after millions of devotees around the world. Even at the age of 90, he's still riding his one-stroke calligraphy. And he came to Australia against all odds to open Nantian Institute. What then is a bodhisattva? It's someone who can work against all odds, not for his own success, but for the benefit of all sentient beings. That is true happiness. True happiness is when I see your transformation and your happiness, and then with that, it comes back to me. We are all in the same network. Your improvement is mine, and my improvement is yours. As I grow in the Dharma every year, I have an opportunity to share my growth with you, and you have an opportunity to share your growth with me. Isn't that happiness? Isn't that being at home? Being, com being comfortable in the Dharma. To know that with the blessings of the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, with us, that is real wealth. That is real treasure. And I hope today, as I go through the 10 keys to, of happiness, we will be able to redefine for ourselves what happiness is. If you can only get one thing out of it, your one key, feel free. Find that key and make that your key to unlock the treasure. And the treasure is not out there. 
is not out in a bank account. The treasure is not out there on my business card. The treasure is inside. And that treasure is so immense. And that treasure is what we want to share. So happiness is when our needs are fulfilled. Happiness is a feeling of contentment. That life is just as it should be. Now people take that as Buddhists are very passive. On the contrary, look at Master Shing, it's anything but passive. Look at the four Huang Buddhists, look at yourself, anything but passive. We are all busy, busy for the good of everyone around us. Perfect happiness is known as enlightenment, according to internationalhappiness.org. And it comes when you have all your needs satisfied. Now, needs are not wants. Okay? Needs are not the chocolate, not the donut, not the Coke. Needs are when we feel fulfilled in the moment. And we are going to go through what that means very quickly. Today, we are going to introduce this book, Ten Paths to Happiness, that's based on a particular sutra or story inside the Great Treasures Collection Sutra, which is a Mahayana set of sutras. So you have opportunity, it's a great set of stories to read. We are going to look at Sumanti, an eight-year-old girl. Can you see through me? Am I blocking you? Okay, to find your way. Okay. So, sorry? All right. All right. So now the eight-year-old young girl who asked the Buddha ten questions. And the ten questions are, hmm, how can I get beauty, proper form? Because when I have beauty, it's a cause for happiness, right? When people see a dignified person, they tend to feel happy. But beauty is not external. Beauty comes from inside out. That is true beauty. That's the glow that we have in the Foban Buddhists. Why? Because we are so hot in the sun. We are all perspiring. But look at us. We are constantly smiling to everybody. We say, give people joy. That's real beauty. Beauty is not in the makeup. Beauty is not in expensive jewelry that we wear. Yes? If you what? If you smile too much, is it? <laughs> now it's from your heart. How you perceive something comes from the heart. If, if we keep a sense of positiveness in everything that we see, everything is beautiful. Right? If I see the Buddha in everyone, isn't the Buddha always smiling? Right? So, I smile, the Buddha smile. I make myself up with the Buddha makeup. This is who I am. Constantly keeping the Buddha in our mind. Attaining wealth and nobility, that again gives us happiness. Because having wealth allows me to give. It allows me to give to many people so that many people can share and fulfill their needs. How can we have family that's harmonious, free from destruction, harmony within the family, extending out to our neighbors, extending out to our colleagues, to the association, to my society? That harmony is what's going to give me happiness. Right? I want to enter a place that feels peaceful. How can I be reborn in the presence of a Buddha? The presence of the Buddha, of course we can wait till the next life, or there are Buddha statues everywhere in the temple. I love 
being a Fokan Buddhist, because wherever I go, I can always see the Buddha. The minute I enter the temple, I can say hello to the Buddha. When I wake up in the morning, hello, good morning, again to the Buddha. And better yet, every time I look into the mirror, I can say hello, Jiwei Buddha. <laughs> I do. My ID, you know, when I log in, it's called Jue Wei Fu. <laughs> Why? Because my master tells me I am Buddha. If my master believes I can be Buddha, I have to acknowledge it. I have to proudly acknowledge it and constantly remind myself and tell myself I am Buddha. You know my name, Jue Wei, what it means? I think my master gives me this name because Jue is awakening, right? Awakening. Wei. Wei means precious piece of jade. Awakening to the fact that I am a precious piece of jade. And what is this precious piece of jade? The Buddha nature that's in me. But that Buddha nature that's in me is actually, it can only shine because of the precious Buddha nature that's in you. If I don't see the Buddha nature in you, I can't see the Buddha nature in me either. So we are all in it together. But in the presence of the Buddha. Every day when I wake up, there's the Buddha statue, but there's also the Buddha in everybody that I see. How can you not be happy? You have no choice but be happy because we're constantly with the wise and the compassionate around us. Then, if, how can one attain supernatural powers, able to travel anywhere? That means have a Singapore passport. <laughs> can go anywhere, almost visa free. We can go anywhere. Then next, wear the yellow vest. <laughs> And you go to the country and you can get yourself into any Foguang Shan temple and always welcome. Isn't that great? Able to travel freely. This gives us the opportunity to visit many Buddha lands. It gives us the opportunity to go seek out the Dharma. So yesterday we covered these five areas. Today, we're now moving on to the next five areas, and that is, how can we live blamelessly? Blamelessly. That means my name, my integrity, that I'm always with, I'm always with integrity. Whatever I do will be positive, and whatever I do will always be guilt-free. How can I ensure that others will trust what I say? Isn't that quite important? If, I, if, um, if whatever we say, we're going to say, wow, you're a Buddhist, I have to believe you because you took the five precepts. You do not lie. And you will not slander. Okay? You will not give malicious um, speech. So it's very important that our words be taken and that our words will be believed. Then, how can one eliminate obstructions in practicing the Dharma? I expect or assume that everybody is here because you have faith in the Dharma. But knowing that theory is half the story, there's another harder half. The other half is called practice. How am I going to practice? And when I practice, how can I avoid having obstructions to my practice? Then, how do I avoid that evil Mara that comes to obstruct me? How do I avoid evil Mara who makes sure that I fail in my endeavors so that Mara can have a lot more disciples than Buddha? How can I do that? And the tenth question, that Sumati asked was, how could I, upon my death, be able to hear the Dharma and be free from suffering? That's so important, isn't it? That a moment of passing, we will be able to go very easily, and yet at the same time, 
I'm going to my Buddha land. But seriously, we don't have to wait till then. How can I go to bed so that I have sweet dreams in the pure land of Amitabha or the Medicine Buddha or whichever Buddha Bodhisattva of our choice? And when I wake up, I'm still with the Buddhas every night and every day. Wouldn't that be beautiful? No nightmares. <laughs> Only sweet dreams of the pure land. So, Sumati Sutra asked these questions and today I'd like you to pick your choice of the answers. So, I'm going to ask for a volunteer if there's one person who can come to help me. What I will do is that I'm going to read out each key. And with the key, if you're interested in finding out the answer the key, please raise your hand. And I hope the volunteer will be able to identify the first person to raise their hand. And all you need to do is to open this envelope. It's unsealed, so don't, don't tear it. Just open it and pick out one piece of the four answers that the Buddha has supplied. So there are four sheets of paper. You can read through them and pick one that you think you'd like to find out more about or that you think is very relevant to you. So we could explore that and you can share with the entire um, session today. So if, uh, would that be good? Yes? Okay. Is, can I get a volunteer who would like to help? Thank you. The key number six, blamelessness. Who would like to learn more about blamelessness? Who would like to acquire blamelessness? Anybody? Blamelessness? Thank you. Just choose one piece. And remember, these are my props. So please return to me. <laughs> Every sheet of paper in the envelope. <laughs> Number seven, trustworthiness. Anybody wants trustworthiness? Thank you. Anybody wants trustworthiness? Anybody wants to be trustworthy? Okay, here. Thank you. No obstructions over there. No obstructions. Thank you. Avoiding Mara. Who would like to avoid the evil Mara? Anybody wants to avoid over there? Thank you. And who would like to see the Buddha? Okay. See the Buddha. All right. If you will pick one piece. So let's look at um, is the microphone available. Yes. Over there, number six. How can one live blamelessly? If you will just um, read out the number and what you've chosen. 6.3. 6.3. Can you read it out, please? Yes. Uh, when others achieve fame, be happy for them. Yes. If we want to be blameless, then what we need to do is to praise others. Very often, we have a very jealous streak in us. You know, when other people are doing well, we wish it were us and not them. It's that streak of jealousy. It's a very little streak, or it could be a big streak in us. But if we are able to practice every time when someone else is doing well, doing better than us, let's give them praise. Let's be happy, genuinely happy for them. Emulating the fine qualities and imitating their good actions, truly caring for others, and one was really magnanimous. Now this is our master, and if you look at the master, behind him, he's actually speaking about who? Confucius. He was in China at that time. Here is a Buddhist monk, a world leader, and is he jealous of Confucius? Because there are Confucius institutes all over the world? No. In fact, 
he talks about the greatness of Confucius. He borrows on the ideas of Confucius and builds upon them. He talks about glorifying Chinese culture as established by Confucius way long time ago during the Warring States, over 2,500 years ago. Confucius was born before the Buddha. But here, how can we, how can we also acquire the sense of blamelessness by always praising others? So when we come together, I'm sure you do, when we come together here in the group and we've learned that so-and-so has done very well, has just returned from what, Bhutan or has come back from a grand um, occasion in the Philippines, having served others. So congratulate, genuinely be joyful and congratulate others for their accomplishments. That will help us to acquire blamelessness within ourselves. So thank you very much for sharing with us. A round of applause. Thank you. And now is trustworthiness. Yes. Would you, the microphone, please? Can the microphone, please? Just behind you. Give me a number. 7.7.1. There we got it. Trustworthiness. Always be consistent in your words and practice. Isn't that, isn't that so true? If you want to be trustworthy, we have to practice what we preach. There are some, I remember once a supervisor told his, um, his subordinates, please do as I say and not do as I do. But we mustn't do that. To be trustworthy, we must be able to practice what we preach. Because if we lose our credibility, it's very hard to earn it back. Trust has to be earned. It's not because I am a venerable, therefore I deserve your trust. Maybe for the first few days. But after a while, if you look at me, I come and talk about happiness, but I'm always frowning. <laughs> and I'm constantly complaining. And I don't have any joy in my heart. You're not going to believe me. Right? I would have lost my trustworthiness. And I wouldn't feel comfortable delivering this talk as well because I'll be telling you, I'm grumpy. <laughs> but the key to happiness is trustworthiness. Are you going to trust me? <laughs> no. So trustworthiness has to come from my own practice. So we are all four Guang Buddhists. As four Guang Buddhists, we know that we walk that Bodhisattva path. Therefore, when I go out there and I wear my vest, I have to go out there joyfully. I go out there with a sense of service. I give people hope. I give others convenience. So I have to practice what my motto is, what I believe in. And I'm sure all of you have done so. I really want to congratulate you for your wonderful job for the Vesak celebration. It was so magnificent. All those flowers that you've arranged, every bit of it. And it's not just one basic, 20 different basics. Now that you are now 20 years old, all the way out there in so many different places, you've got to give yourself a round of applause. For these people to trust you, that you can deliver. Isn't it that we can deliver to our promise? So, thank you very much. <laughs> All right, who has the number eight? Yes, the microphone, please. What? The, num the number? 8.4. Treat all sentient beings with great loving kindness and equanimity. Wonderful. Do you know what equanimity means? No. Alright, let's start with that definition. Equanimity. 
Equanimity means a sense of non duality Accepting everything as is. So, when things go according to my wish, or things do not go according to my wish, I accept it. I do not change my reaction based on what I like and what I do not like. Master Xin Yun teaches us, there is nothing that I absolutely like or absolutely do not like. It's just conditions. I have to treat everything with a sense of equanimity. So, whether I'm ill or whether I'm happy, it shouldn't make a difference in my mind. It's only my body that's suffering. I do not have to hurt my mind. My body may be ill, my mind must not be ill. My body can grow old, my mind can grow younger. Isn't it? Look at all the beautiful faces around. I think many people here have known for, well, 15 to 20 years. I think our body tells us we've aged. The white hair appearing. White hair is just a symbol of wisdom. No worries. <laughs> share the wrinkles on our face that's a symbol of compassion because it is smiling so much <laughs> we treat everything with equanimity we do not have to worry if we fall ill look at the Malakurtis the Bodhisattva who fell ill so that he can show everyone what illness means to treat everything with non-duality we are not falling sick without our learning our lessons we mustn't let any experience go by without learning the dharma from it never because we are true buddhists Every experience, whether we are with someone we like, we are with our enemies, is an experience of a lifetime. Because it allows me to cultivate my sense of wisdom and my sense of kindness. Treating all sentient beings with loving kindness. Great compassion means that is not just for one person. One person is love. I can love my partner. But great compassion says, I love more than just my partner and my children. I love all, all people and all sentient beings, including the ants. When I was in Yilan, I was, I was teaching English to a group of um, Taiwanese children and I found that I actually learned more from the children than I did teaching them English. One particular child, this young boy I couldn't forget, told me that that very day he fed the ends on his study desk with biscuit crumbs. That was so sweet of him. Because there was this row of ants, and he knows, you know what ants do? They're looking for food, right? What do most of us do? We stop their path <laughs> and get them out of the house. But this young boy, equanimity. He doesn't think of these ants as ants. He thinks of them as his friends, hungry friends. So what do you do when you meet a hungry friend? You give them food. So what does he have? He has some biscuits. A biscuits too big, right? He made them into crumbs for the ants to take home. Treating all sentient beings with great loving kindness and equanimity. So what do you think? In the future, 
I think that when this boy grows up, if he has any kind of trouble, these ants will come to help him. <laughs> but there will be plenty of ants to help him, isn't it? <laughs> Never look down on any being. Because the fact that there's an ant, it's because it has the karma of being very hardworking. <laughs> That's all, right? And that good karma is going to bring it one day to become a human being and to become a Buddha. All beings have the Buddha nature. It's up to us how we want to uncover our Buddha nature. And every being can help us do it. So, harmonious coexistence so important. We must live together with all beings. Now sometimes we unfortunately cause some insects to go to their pure land very quickly. <laughs> unfortunately, accidentally that happens. So we all have, we all can at least say only four, four right? Four characters. At least constantly chant only to for to those insects or those beings and send them to visualize them. Visualize them being reborn atop a lotus flower in the pure land. And still, you can still be their friends. So we'll have plenty of friendships in this beautiful world. Shall we do that? Well, thank you. Alright, the Mara. 9.1. 9.1. Completely understand that Dharma nature is equal. Thank you. Do you know what Dharma nature means? No. Alright, let's start with Dharma nature. What is Dharma? Does anybody, can anybody tell me what is Dharma? Dharma? Teachings of the Buddha. Did you hear that? Correct. The teachings of the Buddha. But Dharma is also the phenomenal world, phenomenon. This book is Dharma. This, my voice that you hear, that's also Dharma. These flowers, that's Dharma. This body, that's Dharma. Dharma nature. What is that? What is that? That is the essence of the teachings and the essence of all that's around us. And to know that the Dharma nature is the same. That's the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. All these three, the triple gem, they're actually one and the same. They're different and yet the same. If we look deep down inside of us, deep down underneath, that goodness that's in us, that's our Buddha nature. The kindness that's in us, that's our Buddha nature. The wisdom that's in us, that's also our Buddha nature. And not only I have it, you have it too. You have it too. And so does the end have it too. We all have that Buddha nature. But not only that, this book, this inanimate object, this microphone, they all have a Dharma nature. And that Dharma nature is what we call emptiness. Emptiness. We are all made up of conditions. Interdependent conditions. I am who I am because my parents gave me this body. They fed me. I am who I am because my teachers taught me. I am who I am because everyone around me reflected back on me and to me. I am made up of all these conditions. But not just in this life. 
in all my previous lives as well. So I am in our conditions, and so is this book, so is this cup, so is everything. So that is our Dharma nature. What is Mara? What is Mara? Mara are obstacles to me discovering this Dharma nature. Obstacles to me seeing the Buddha nature that's in me. And where do these obstacles come from? Two types, external and internal. External are everything that I can come through my senses. So, for example, the chocolate, when I already have diabetes. That is my, what, my senses. My sense organs tell me, mm, I, love, I love this look of the chocolate. I love the smell of the chocolate. Then, the internal Mara comes, it's called greed. <laughs> the internal Mara appears next. What does the internal Mara do? It motivates my fingers to move towards the chocolate. <laughs> and then, before anybody sees what's happening, I popped it into my mouth. And I tell it, you can't stop me now, it's inside. <laughs> There's nothing better to do now, swallow. <laughs> And then, wait, ah, take my diabetes medicine. <laughs> what is that called? Samsara. <laughs> that is my cycle of birth and death. That's how I build up my bad habits. That's Mara. That's Mara appearing in these little, little forms. But if I know that everything around me I'm inherently Buddha. That chocolate is just conditions, right? It's just cocoa powder and milk and, okay, a lot of loving kindness in it. Then after that, I look at the condition of me. Mm, doctor just took my, just took my medical record and told me I have diabetes and there's a list of cannot eat and on the list is called chocolate. So I match, match. <laughs> then I check in for one minute. <laughs> check in for one minute. Mm, okay, breathe, calm down, discover my Buddha nature. Aha, uh -huh. wisdom, wisdom surfaces and say, well, just so that the doctor doesn't tell me that I've been very naughty, so that I can get better and I don't have to take more diabetes medicine, I'm gonna let it go. I'm gonna let it go. That is what overcoming Mara, a step at a time. Is it difficult? Is it difficult? Yes. <laughs> okay, now it's time for meditative concentration. More minute check-ins. <laughs> See what minute check-ins do is that they really help us cultivate that sense. You know, it check us, pause, be still, don't move, stop the fingers from stretching out, pause. It's that pause that will help us to think and avoid Mara and pull back. Okay? So in order to do so, we need that mind of equanimity to be able to see how I have to improve so everyone improve. Like I say, we all grow in the Dharma together so that we can have a very peaceful Dharma realm. So thank you very much. <laughs>
we need faith. Faith in the teachings of the Buddha, faith in that Buddha will be good for us, and that the Buddha is in us. The Dharma are wholesome teachings. They are wholesome teachings because they are not only beneficial to me, they are beneficial to others. That means I have to lift myself out of selfishness. Lifting myself. That's not easy. We are all trained and groomed to take care of ourselves. And it's, it's a program that's inside us. All of us know that we have to run to safety. Isn't it? Whenever there's turbulence on the plate, the first thing we, we do, oh, my life. Hang on to life. We are innately programmed to save ourselves, but saving ourselves is also to save the species as a whole. So that's innately programmed. But now is to lift ourselves out of that selfishness and egocentricness and move it out to something even bigger. And that is beneficial to me and also to others. First of all, my family, the mother's love. Being a mother's love is sacrificial. Taking that mother's love beyond. Tomorrow is Father's Day. It's the day we celebrate the love our fathers have for us. It's also the day that we recall how fathers around the world have built this world. They made a lot of sacrifices and work in order to provide for the home. They've made a lot of sacrifices on themselves and their own time. They may eat less in order that the family be well fed. But the fathers, more than ever, the four one fathers, also bring the family together to this place. And they give up so much, even of family time, in order to contribute to the four one family. Shall we give a round of applause to all of them? The fathers bring happiness to the world. And who is the greatest father of us all? The Buddha. He is our father in so many different ways. So when we look at our fathers, we see the Buddha. When we look at other people's fathers, we see the Buddha. The Buddha is with us, all around us. And when our fathers teach us that, teaching from their heart, because they want us to be safe, they want us to grow. So I'm those wholesome teachings. And the Buddha, the Buddha gave up his career as a king, a universal king, in order to be enlightened to what the world is all about. And he taught for 49 years, and he built up a system so that even today, we are able to benefit from these teachings. Our universal father. So tomorrow, as we celebrate Father's Day, remember, honor our fathers, but also honor the Buddha. Okay, well, thank you very much. Every one of us has produced that deep faith in us. Um, I need all my props back, because I still have to go to JB tomorrow. <laughs> Let me just, um, thank you, thank you. The 10 keys to happiness, they are all available. All the 40 teachings and much more are available in this very easy to read book. I read it on my flight here. So eight hours, that's all it takes. And you can finish reading this book in less time than that. It's very, very readable. So what I have, done is I made a summary of what's in the book. 
um, they are all in the book, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I understand that we want to do some time for Q&A later. So here are all the 40 answers to happiness. Now, so happiness is the goal. We all want to go towards happiness and towards as Buddhists. Happiness is about enlightenment. So we want to reach this enlightened, happy state. And there are 10 causes for this happy state. Proper form, life of perfect wealth, maintaining harmony, but the presence of a Buddha traveling freely, living blamelessly, being trustworthy, eliminating obstructions, avoiding fire, and seeing the Buddha. These are causes. And for each of these causes, there are four conditions that the Buddha has highlighted and that our master has elaborated in this book. So I hope every one of you will be able to take the opportunity to read it carefully because all I've done today is just given you some foundations based on your needs, based on your choice. What I would like to go on to is something that we've just had, which is Vesak, right? We just celebrated Vesak, and I celebrated Vesak in um, Australia, going to four different places. Yesterday I showed you a video on the Buddha Charita. Today, I like Buddha Charita being the um, earliest known full-length biography of the Buddha. It's a very beautiful um, video that is available on our website. And today I want to show you a different video that we've made also with volunteers from around the world on the life of Venerable Master Shinye. Would you like to see it? Yes. In 1952, 
a lay Buddhist invited me to teach Buddhism at Lei Temple in Ilan. I began to fulfill my long-held vow of spreading humanistic Buddhism. In 1964, I went to Kaohsiung to establish Shaoshan Temple and Buddhist College. Three years later, I established Phong Guan Shan Monastery. My lay disciples from the five continents helped me to establish temples around the world. We came to Australia in 1990. disasters, such as the floods in Queensland, bushfires in the Blue Mountains, and earthquakes in Christchurch caused catastrophic damage and many casualties. I immediately called upon BLIA members around the world to offer aid. I strive to build a pure land that is blessed by personal harmony achieved through equanimity. Family harmony achieved through deference. Interpersonal harmony achieved through respect. Social harmony achieved through cooperation. And world harmony achieved through peace. to build tertiary institutions and propose million education sponsors to encourage the public to join us in our efforts. Hence the establishment of University of the West, Nanwa University, Fo Guang University, Nantian Institute and Guangming University. As I reflect on my life, those days of adversity have become my inspiration. My wish is to spread humanistic Buddhism and bring happiness to every home. And that is our master. We are so fortunate to have a master who wishes to bring happiness to every home. True happiness. And isn't that what we feel here? That wherever we go, we always have a happy home. But he didn't do this without putting in effort. I think his life itself is such a beautiful story of how through adversities we can grow and become stronger. It is very common that many of us try to avoid difficult situations. Whenever there's any suffering, we run away from it. But look at Master. He's been through so much in his life. And because his, as you know, his vision and his vows is always mission impossible, and accomplishing one mission impossible after another, we all grow. And that's how we see the Buddha in us, to recognize that potential that's in us. Eliminate those negative thoughts. Just think positive and just go for it. I think Nikes just do it. Huh? <laughs> it's very Fo Guang like. <laughs> okay, now, besides, besides, um, doing movies this year. The Buddhist Birthday Education Project is something that I run every year. In the past year, we've had different videos and artworks. We've also been putting all these up on our website. 
Buddhist Birthday Education Project. So if you Google us, Buddhist Birthday Education Project, you will find us at paradeofthebuddhas.org. I've had volunteers. Everything that I've done is voluntary. I haven't spent a single cent. So thanks to all the four pound Buddhists around the world. That particular animation you saw earlier was made possible by four pound Buddhists from Canada, from America, from Taiwan, and of course Australia. Um, the art work, everything, the exhibition was actually made by Gissi Chan. From here, Singapore, she made that exhibition. <laughs> We're preserving it on, um, in this format. Now, besides the uh, Buddhist Birth Education Project, we also have apps, smartphone apps. So, let's see. Mm. Take a while to get there. So this is the website paradeofthebuddhas.org and there are many sections and we come down here to the app section. We've got a little video for you. Very short. Right? It is our reminder, it's our alarm clock, it's, it's a tool. But at the same time, if we don't use it well, we become a slave to it. Isn't it? It's constantly beeping. Even at night. I know of people who are constantly attending to their smartphones because of the beeps and they never get a good night's sleep. We come in first thing in the morning, social media. How many likes did I get? And if I don't get enough likes, depression. <laughs> it's true. But instead, what we could do, download good apps. There are many good apps in the market now. There are apps for mindfulness training, for meditation. There are apps with beautiful quotes of the master. So I welcome everyone to come and download our app that's on iOS as well as on Google Play, just for BBEP, for Buddha's Birthday Education Project. I also have Humanistic Buddhism Q&A cards. Designed to this in December last year as a game. I've been told, we don't have many For example, what it does is it has the beautiful lotuses, the lotus flowers on one side, and it has a question. So for example, the question here says, where can one find happiness? So with a group of friends, you can discuss, discuss, discuss. So where can we find happiness? Then we can turn around and look at what Master says, the answer. Happiness is always dwelt within our own hearts. So where do we find happiness? Within our own hearts. There is no use in praying to the divine or begging the Buddha to find happiness. 
you should find it inside us. So if you have the words in red called within our own hearts, you get one point. So you can play a game. Now, for those of you who may not have an opportunity to get a set of cards outside, don't worry, there are many people. I brought up 60 sets here. So there are at least 60 people who have been here yesterday and today who have these sets. So play the game with them. And those who have it, please share with friends around so we can all play the game. I've brought this here because I hope that this could be also a way for you to make an affinity, a connection with Nantian Institute in Australia. So whatever amount of donation you like to give, it's all right. It's an opportunity for us to let the Dharma continue. Let the pure land be built down under in Australia. So if you give us a donation of any amount, you can get a set of cards. And even if you don't get a set of cards, you're still welcome to make that connection because there are very few Buddhist-founded universities in the world, and this is founded in Australia. It's the first tertiary institution that's based on Buddhist values and wisdom, built by Chinese, built by Buddhists, and venerable Malcolm, your former abbess, made it up. She has the vow of the master, constantly building pure land after pure land. Look at this building here. Isn't this your pure land? She's now building the next home down under. So, shall we support her? Yes. yes. I'll send, I'll send her your confidence in her and I'll send her all your well wishes. You know, in her heart, there's always a space for you. She's constantly looking at what you've done for her and trying to duplicate the good work here in Australia. And I can tell you, it's very tough. It's very, very tough. Australia is a big piece of land. People are very scattered. So let's all enjoy what we've got, the fellowship that we've got. Many people ask me, why do I keep the Buddhist Birth Education Project going? It's, I think, a miracle. I always call it the magic of BBDP. But it's because it's so difficult to do, you know, working with volunteers who are very busy and very scattered around the world, that I discovered so much about the Buddha. First of all, BBDP is done in honor of the Buddha. And I call it My Buddha Project. From it, I learned so much about what it means to be a Buddha. It begins with what I call waking up. The Master tells us there are three phases of our life. The first is zijue, self-awakening. Wake up. Wake up, okay, alarm clock in the morning rings. Be, wake up. You know, between waking up and the next step, number two, call, get up. <laughs> There's a distance. <laughs> Isn't it? Wake up is really hard enough. <laughs> Alarm rings, you don't want to say, what? <laughs> what is that? I must be dreaming and ignore. Right? Now, waking up is difficult. Getting up is worse. Getting up means I have to go through one phase. And, okay, between after getting up, next one is to actually get up and light up. Turning on the lights in the morning, in the room, turning on the light and turning on the light that's inside of me. Because for the day, my mission is to light up people's lives. I go to work to light up people's lives. I go into the kitchen to light up my family's life. I come to four time to light up even more people's lives. So Master says there are three phases in our cultivation. Self-awakening, then me, 
going on to the passage myself, finally also helping others. And then you come back again, because you know, we take little steps at a time, you know, cycle, cycle, it's a positive spiral. So I give them my, my interpretation, wake up, get up, and I love Between wake up and get up, I've discovered it takes sacrifice. The Buddha. The Buddha sacrificed his family. He left his baby son Rahula, beautiful Yasodhara, the princess, in order that he can light up the world. He has to make that sacrifice. So the same thing. In order that we know that alarm has rung, and to get out of bed, we have to sacrifice that sleep, that warm blanket. We have to sacrifice. So it's the same thing. For us to come here to Fort Han and to be able to sit here, we are also sacrificing. We sacrifice our dinner with friends. We sacrifice our social life. We sacrifice our time in bed. Or the time with my smartphone. <laughs> But, in order to become the Buddha, just before his enlightenment, Prince Siddhartha had to battle. Battle with who? The Mara inside of him. Right? There's always a battle. So the same thing. Between getting up and lining up, there is a battle. The battle with that ego inside of me. We don't want to light up. I just want to be in the dark. In order to get rid of any negativity, it takes a battle. It takes battle to get rid of my laziness. It takes battle to get out of my comfort zone. Battle. But if we can fight that battle and win that battle, we are closer to seeing the Buddha. We are closer to be really happy. That is real enlightenment. That is happiness. Isn't it? So I hope every one of us, every day, will be able to wake up, get up, and light up. And light up the world. The 10 keys to happiness required means that for us, understanding lining up, understanding what it takes to light up the world, and I hope today you have taken home something, one thing that may be meaningful, even if it's as simple as checking in. We've got about, what, 12 minutes, so I'd be happy to take any questions from the floor related to the topic or not. Any questions? First of all, are you happier? Yes. <laughs> or now? Mm -hmm. Too much food for thought. <laughs> Happiness doesn't come for free. Happiness comes with effort. Happiness comes with us cultivating the causes and the conditions. Happiness requires us to give, to sacrifice, to battle, because that's the sustainable happiness. It requires us to recognize who is Mara and who is Buddha. It requires us to recall our precepts, so that we do not harm others. And on top of that, to give. Happiness. Happiness is a pursuit. So it's like the movie, the pursuit of happiness. It's a process. It's a process of being happier every time. I hope that what the talk has done is given you food for thought. 
experience for us to work on. Later on, as you leave, I hope that you will pick up Master's sayings to you today. I have designed these Bodhi leaves. On these Bodhi leaves, um, on one side is the Buddha sitting on a pedestal of QR code. It leads you to my website, parainofthebuddhas.org. And on the other side is Taigen Han, Humble Table Wise Fair, words from the Master. There are 52 unique sayings, so you have um, one in 52 chance that you will pick up the same saying as yesterday. But I welcome everyone to pick up something because this message is our first aid. This message is an area of saying, what are the things that, what are areas that we should continue cultivating? Our work is in here. And these are all made possible because of Venerable Michael who supported us and also the designers. Designer comes, we came from Melbourne. The printer came from Sydney. The words in here came from um, Taiwan because there's the uh, Institute for Humanistic Buddhism that did the translation. Venerable Miao Guang was in here several times. And of course, all the designs made possible. So, questions? Otherwise, we're going to have an early break. Any questions? Any questions? Please take this opportunity to ask uh, Shibu questions because you won't. It is, it is a very rare opportunity for Shibu to be over here because she's usually busy teaching at the Nantin Institute. So, probably you can take one minute to absorb and uh, try to condense whatever you want to ask him. You will ask Shibu in one minute. Okay, probably just to start the ball rolling. Yes, oh, okay. Yeah, question yeah. or comment? <laughs> Uh, uh, good evening, Venerable. Good evening. It's not comments, but they are questions. Okay, right. Uh, you pose the questions to the floor and uh, nobody answer. I think basically this is Singapore society. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we are at a, probably we are at a stage of uh, number one, wake up, get up, and uh, your thoughts. How can we actually light up? You know, asking questions. Sometimes, why is it so difficult for us to ask questions? But you know, in the West, before I finish speaking, all the hands are up. <laughs> when, I'm, when I'm giving lectures in America, more so than Australia, in America, I only need to prepare one third. <laughs> so if you tell me it is a, uh, let's say for this timer, uh, one and a half hours, I only need half an hour's presentation. The other one hour, all questions. <laughs> all Q&A. Why? What is, where is that difference? The difference is in the inquisitive mind. Do you realize that Americans are very creative? And why are they so creative? Because they're constantly questioning. Can this be better? Why is this so? Are you sure? <laughs> Where is the proof? Give me evidence. That's what it is. Those children are so cute. They come and ask me, why the Buddha wear no shoes? <laughs> I didn't even notice it. <laughs> they have a mind of curiosity and being so observant. Why? We are not in the moment. That's why. We are not in the moment absorbing things and really studying the con conditions and asking ourselves, why is that so? Then, do we really want to improve? Or are we happy where we are? If we really want to improve, and that's my goal, I really want to be the Buddha. I have lots of questions. What does it mean to be a Buddha? Nobody asked me. <laughs> what does it really mean to be a Buddha? 
But this is emptiness you're looking at. What does it mean to look inside of me? I say relax, scan the body, and you're just scan. I really wonder you really scan. <laughs> Do you really know what I'm talking about? Can you feel the muscles in you? Are you really relaxing? I don't know. <laughs> Whereas in Australia, when I type scan the body, immediately they ask me, how? <laughs> how do you scan? Asking questions. The other, the, other, the other reason why we don't ask questions may be that we have a question, but I say it. <laughs> Face very thin. That's why we don't ask. Because we don't want to appear like a loser. Right? In the classroom, you ask questions, and teachers say stupid question. <laughs> so I say, right? But no. In Buddhism, there are no stupid questions. There are no stupid questions. Every question has this value. However, there could be questions that are not timely. There could be questions that maybe are inappropriate for that occasion. That requires us to have wisdom, to understand the conditions. Whether you ask a question or not, there's actually nothing to lose. If you think about it that way, there's nothing to lose. If you know that there's nothing to lose, then what's the fear? Because at the end of class, I'm going to get a whole bunch of people around me and everyone asks questions. <laughs> then I cannot leave. <laughs> but you know what happens? If you harbor that question inside of you and not share it, you are actually being very selfish. Isn't it? Because your very question may benefit a lot more people. Once you think of it that way, you become the bodhisattva. But generating questions is really not easy. For me to think of, oh, what am I going to do next? So last year I did Dharma class, this year I'm going to do Bodhivis, next year what do I want to do? It takes creativity and it takes courage. And it also takes the ability to withstand failures. But if I can't even do this, how to become Buddha? You know Buddha, the grand shrine in um, Foguangshan and also in, in Nantian Temple, it's called Ba Xiong Bao Dian. Ba Xiong, the great hero, the great, the great hero must have a lot of courage. Then you can fight the battle. So what's happening is the self, the little self in us that's talking. And also it's easier to listen, <laughs> isn't it? No pressure, sit down there and listen, that's all. But the minute you ask a question, it shows how little I know. Or it shows, it shows too much about myself and I, I want to hide, I want to package myself. But to see things as they really are, I've got to unveil myself. I've got to be bold enough to tell you all my, all my weaknesses and not just show you my strength. I'll be courageous enough. And all this, we take a step at a time. For me, it's okay. I'm Singaporean. I'm used to the fact that you know, people don't ask questions. <laughs> I generate my own questions. That's all right. And they always teach our teacher. Home early. <laughs> Even better, isn't it? <laughs> Alright, any last question? Yes. Oh, so many. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Shall we have you to ask the question first? <laughs> mainly I mainly I have not been doing too well in my class. Yes. So, but then I also don't have any because because of the fact that I part of a competitive team in a video game. Uh, yeah. So I do balance up my brain die and studying. So, so, so. What's 
the question, the question is there. Okay. Studying. All of us are studying for our entire lives. The fact that we do not do well in our studies, whether the result is good or not, is not the issue. It's the process. It's the process. Buddhahood is about the process. Am I working hard? Am I forming good friendships with people who are doing well so that they can help me? They can teach me. Am I willing to listen? Am I willing to learn in the process? I, as long as I go from maybe zero mark to one mark to two to three, I'm making the progress. That's more important. I don't have to go all the way from zero to 50 and then to 100. If I can do a little bit at a time and make the effort, that is what is most important. And I wish you all the best in your studies. I hope that you work hard. And sometimes it's the subject. You know, not all of us can do everything, right? Some of us may not be able to do English very well, but my Mandarin is good. Some of us cannot do studies very well, but I can be a great artist. Some of us are good with mechanics. It's finding our area of strength. Just keep going. You will make it. Have faith. There's another question back here. Any other questions? All right. Shifu, so I actually have one last question. Uh, yes. So um, basically we were talking about happiness and happiness comes from giving. But the thing is that I think one issue that many of us face is that when we give too much, we run out of our own happiness. Oh. So how do we ensure that we don't run out of this, yes. this, this and the joy that we have in us? Great question. You know how that we get very tired physically we can be physically very tired when we give and we give and we give. What's important? We can be physically tired, but my mind must not be tired. 人满心不满 How do I keep my mind not so tired? Remember our meditative concentration. When we are tired, take that one minute check-in. That's most precious. It allows us to ground ourselves and also to realize I'm doing this for the benefit of others. We are never as tired or as busy as the master. We can't be. Build a team. We are not in it alone. If you are overstretched, you don't have enough team members. We are Mahayana, you know, great vehicle. Bring in more people to help bringing more people. And that's what I do. The teams must grow. Then you get more people to help you. And bring in more talents. There's so many people out there who may want to join this for one family. Most important of all, mustn't lose our initial resolve, our body mind, our bodhi shin. And the bodhi shin, we have made a vow to learn the Buddha Dharma to learn the teachings to serve all people, to serve all beings. Get help. Don't struggle on your own. Yes, and I, I think it happens to all of us as for one Buddhist. We all know, I know. <laughs> Constantly tired, always sleep deprived. So what do we do? Check in. I, that's my saving, that's my saving grace. It keeps me going. <laughs> All right, shall we check out? Please. Now that we've checked in, let's... Oh, one more question. Yes, please. Jixia. <laughs> Self-awakening. What it means is... Is I have to keep my eyes open. I have to look at everything around me. Every time I have a feeling in my heart that's negative, every time I feel that moment when 
I don't feel joy anymore. I must be completely aware. And that's the time when I take my pox and then transform it. So you have to transform it into something positive. But the first thing is to be constantly aware. That's why we do meditation. Meditation is mindfulness. Being completely aware of the moment. I urge you that if you have not learned your meditation skills, please do. That will help us become very aware of how the thoughts in my mind and the feelings in my heart. That's my zi That's my wake up call. And I scan it to make sure that it's always positive. And positive means it's always for the benefit of others. It's always a win-win. Thank you. Yeah, let's check we will out. Check out first. Let's, let's check yeah. out. So we checked in today. We are going to end today's session and the whole of these um, 10 keys to happiness. So let's check out by joining palms. May palms in every world be joined in kindness, compassion, joy, and generosity. May all beings find security in friendship, peace, and loving care. May calm and mindful practice give rise to deep patience and equanimity. May we give rise to spacious hearts and humble thoughts of gratitude. Me too. Please rise. Let us once again thank Venerable Jury for a very practical and wise lecture tonight. Let us give her a round of applause. <laughs> thank you, Venerable Jury. Thank Thank you everyone for joining us tonight in our lecture. So, Venerable Jerry will be out there to give you a good evening. But just before you leave, just one short announcement. There is this feedback form on the table. Please help us fill in this.